persons should not be using NWC water, portable water, for watering gardens, lawns, grounds, for refilling or supplying tanks, ponds, swimming pools, or for any purpose which may require the use of a considerable or excessive quantity of water. A prohibition order is now in effect for 90 water systems in drought-affected areas across the island. So be sure to practice responsible water usage and, of course, conserve this precious commodity. Get some more conservation tips next. Water, water again. Water again. But we need water for cook. So how we go wash? Let's weather the drought. Start conservation measures today. Check for leaks around your house. Opt for shorter showers over long baths. Reuse water to water plants and lawn. Watch the amount of water you and your family use. Try cooking methods that don't require much water. And if you have a vehicle, avoid washing it regularly. Remember, water is as important as the air we breathe. So conserve our water, conserve our life. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Monday, May 27. Cabinet has given the go-ahead to have video surveillance on road networks across the island. Minister of Transport and Mining Robert Montague says the decision follows the over 170 persons who have lost their lives to traffic crashes since the start of the year. We are fully committed to ensuring that our roads are very forgiving. So efforts are being made to ensure that the requisite roadside objects are strategically placed on the network to ensure the best chances of survival should a traffic accident occur. The minister was speaking at the recent launch of the Jamaica Driver and Traffic Safety Expo. He also disclosed that the Transport Authority would be undertaking training programs for taxi drivers to ensure they have defensive driving skills and can be qualified for their taxi badges. Architectural designs for the construction of judicial complexes in St. Anne, St. James and Manchester are to be completed this financial year. Family courts in St. Catherine, St. Thomas, Manchester and Hanover are also to be refurbished and expanded as well as the Maypen Parish Court. Minister of Justice Delroy Chuck made the disclosures in Parliament recently. The mandate of the new face of justice has been paramount in the evolving landscape of Jamaica's development thrust. And fittingly so, as the reform of the justice sector is a priority of the Government of Jamaica under the National Development Plan 2030. But this new face of justice, Mr. Speaker, will graduate into what will be the mantra of the Ministry of Justice, first-class justice. Not only facilities, service, but the delivery generally across Jamaica. He says justice centers will be established next year in St. Andrew, Kingston, Hanover, St. James, Manchester, Clarendon, St. Thomas, and St. Catherine. 300 young people are to receive training in bartending on the Red Stripes Bar Academy program. The training is being facilitated by a partnership with the Heart Trust NTA. It entails two weeks of classroom instruction and a four-week internship, during which participants will receive a weekly stipend of $5,000. At the recent launch of the 2019 edition of the program, Culture and Entertainment Minister Olivia Grange said the new cohort of bartenders and mixologists would add to Jamaica's thriving creative economy. The Red Stripe Bar Academy program is in its 11th year of delivering tailored skills and relevant knowledge-based tools to aspiring bartenders. Government is moving to get more girls involved in science, technology, engineering and mathematics STEM. This follows a 2018 survey done by the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology which showed that significantly more males than females enrolled in IT-based subjects for the Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate, CSEC. Portfolio Minister Fable Williams says more women are needed in technology. In a rapidly changing technological era, we cannot afford to have distinctions between men and women. I believe that you our girls and women have tremendous knowledge that when harnessed can contribute to building a strong technology infrastructure for Jamaica. 
The minister was speaking at the opening ceremony for the 2019 Girls Hackathon. The event was held to observe International Girls in ICT Day to encourage women to bridge the gap in digital skills. The Ministry of Health and Wellness has developed a physical activity guide in Braille. The guide was published in partnership with the Combined Disabilities Association and was recently launched. It was done for the first time in Braille to promote healthy lifestyle and the prevention of non-communicable diseases among visually impaired persons. In Jamaica, physical inactivity accounts for 12% of all-cause mortality, contributing to 13% of breast cancer, 14% of colon cancer, 8% of coronary heart disease, and 10% of type 2 diabetes. These exposures lead to elevated blood pressures, elevated blood sugars, overweight, and obesity, and by extension, um, we, this leads to non-communicable diseases. The launch came a week after the Health and Wellness Ministry launched the Physical Activity Bible as a resource for church leaders to support the health and wellness of their congregations. Physical activity is one of the components of the Jamaica Moves program, which also includes healthy eating and age-appropriate health checks. And finally, the America's first ever conference on tourism, innovation, resilience, and crisis management will be hosted by Jamaica. The conference will focus on tourism disruption resilience. It will be staged in Montego Bay next year, bringing together global leaders from the region. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett made the announcement while addressing the 64th meeting of the UN World Tourism Organization's Regional Commission for the Americas, held recently in Guatemala. He said Jamaica was able to have the support of the entire commission to host the conference, and it spoke to the country being positioned as a center for tourism innovation and resilience. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching. keeps our bodies working, our food nutritious, our living and working spaces clean and our lives comfortable. Water, the most precious resource necessary for the sustenance of life on our planet. Don't waste it. Let's conserve on this critical commodity. In the house, invest in storage containers and buckets. Take quick showers instead of long baths and invest in water efficient shower heads, toilets and faucets. You may also want to consider one-pot meals and cooking methods that don't require much water. You could also wash fruits and vegetables in a bowl and reuse the water on your plants or grass. When cleaning dishes, fill both sinks and use one for washing and the other for rinsing. The leftover water can be used to wash off the concrete or asphalt in your yard. If you must wash your car at home, aim for once a fortnight and use a bucket to do the washing instead of running the hose. Don't delay. Start your water conservation practices today. The state, through the Ministry of Education, is committed to providing an enabling environment for all our children to reach their full potential. Hear how the Ministry is facilitating the learning experience for children with autism. There is much more to educating our children than confining them to textbooks or curricula. Every child has their learning style and sometimes it's made difficult when it's compounded with a learning disorder. Hello, I'm Carrie Ann Smith. The number of diagnosed cases of autism in Jamaica is on the increase. And the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information is tasked with the responsibility of ensuring that provisions are in place to facilitate the learning of these students. With me is Acting Assistant Chief Education Officer in the Special Education Unit in the Ministry, Mrs. Ann Newman. Welcome. Thank you, Carrie. All right, so let's get into it. What are the numbers as it relates to the increase in autism in schools? 
Okay, the Center for Disease Control in the United States suggests that there is a ratio of one in every 68 births. When that is applied to a Jamaican birth rate in Jamaica, it means that as many as 500 odd students or children could be born with autism. Okay. And, and there is, it is skewed towards boys, so the ratio is 4 to 1. Alright, before we even get into exploring the issue, what is autism? Autism spectrum disorder is a developmental disorder that's usually diagnosed by age 4. Children with autism or, the spec or who are on the spectrum usually manifest some disorders in communication, um, social disorders, and very often have behavioral disorders. So how is the ministry handling the cases in schools? Well, for the cases that come to our attention, because remember that we now have a passbook that's read, um, monitored in the Early Childhood Commission years. So students coming over to main ministry would travel with their passbook. And hopefully by that time, at age six, mm -hmm. they would have been diagnosed. Unfortunately, some students have fell through the cracks and are not diagnosed as early. So once they, they're brought to our attention and there is a diagnosis, then we can do the appropriate placement. Remember I said it's a spectrum disorder, so some children are, have a mild case oh, okay. and some children more moderate or severe. Students who are on the spectrum need different interventions. So depending on the severity of the diagnosis, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, they are placed in the appropriate settings. Students with mild autism usually are educated in the mainstream, whereas others who are severe or in the moderate range are educated in our special schools. Okay, so it's important for them to be diagnosed early. Critical, critical, critical. Uh, early diagnosis and intervention is the key to the measure of success we have. Right, so now that you're talking, it seems to me it's a holistic approach because parents need to ensure that if it is that they're seeing any of these signs that they get their children tested. Parents need to remember that they're usually their child's first teacher and they need to follow their instinct and wherever they have reason to be suspicious that something could not be quite so right, mm -hmm. it is their responsibility to seek professional advice okay. and assistance. All right. So what are the programs or intervention strategies that are in place to ensure that these children are not lost in the system? Okay, again, we go back to early intervention. Right. Once students are diagnosed, mm -hmm. then it is the responsibility of the parents. And if they're in a school program, early childhood, or wherever they may be on the continuum, it is mm -hmm. the responsibility of the system to make the appropriate referrals. Persons can come to ministry at any time, the special education unit, for us to advise and help with placement of students. I know that the ministry uh, promotes an inclusive, integrated system. Are the schools prepared for this? There is some measure of preparedness. Um, since 2005, all teachers in Teachers College were exposed to an introductory course in exceptionalities. This course really is just a cursory course and it means that teachers in the regular system should be able to detect and have reasons to suspect that if a child is not developing along the normal path mm -hmm. and suggest to parents that they have the child assessed. Once the assessment is done and the diagnosis is made, you'll get a fulsome report that gives recommendations as to the way where the child should be educated and programs that the child will need, support programs that the child will need. In addition to the training of teachers, we now have special needs coordinators who work with the regular schools that will develop and present workshops right. depending on the needs in the school. And those children who are in the mainstream can be educated by specially trained special educators in pull-out classes or self-contained classes. Okay, and how, how should we treat these children? You know, many times we label them as um, just rude, out of order. How, how, do, how should we even react to them? Well, first of all, it needs an understanding. Yeah. And um, sometimes we are not as sympathetic as we ought to be. Mm -hmm. But the first thing is, if we give unconditional love, then we will 
see that children who may act outside of what we consider the norm are actually having some difficulty. And we need to just be empathetic to their parents, not to label them. Thank you so much. Um, but before we go, can you just leave us with a few tips, parents, teachers, as to how we can deal with children with autism? I can't overemphasize. Early intervention is the best. And I would also recommend to parents, once a child has been diagnosed to be on the spectrum, that they join a support group. There's a Jamaica Autism Support Group. And just to get feedback and support from other parents who are in a similar situation, cuts the, the, the journey in half. And to teachers, seek more information. There's always, as a professional, we always need to develop and grow. Seek, there's a lot of information on the net. Mm -hmm. Seek more information. It will make you a better professional. Thank you so much, Mrs. Newman. My pleasure. Sign with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Sign with me. As the CEO of the National Parenting Support Commission, I want to speak specifically to parents to affirm your children. A, acknowledge. In other words, recognize your child's importance. F, friend. Understand that there must be mutual affection, that bonding is absolutely important. It must be encouraged. F. Favor. Your children desire your approval and your support. When they meet your expectations, do not just ignore them, but support and encourage them. I. Influence. In a time when some of our influences could be called into question, we need to ensure that as parents, we become the most important influence in the lives of our children. We want parents to get involved in the lives of their children. We want them to lead by example, and we want you to encourage your children's dreams and aspirations. Our respect. Respect is something that we must teach our children. As adults, I want to caution though, that is also something we must earn. We must not only expect respect to be reciprocated because we're adults, we must show it. We must model for our children what it means to respect. Motivate. Be your child's cheerleader. Speak positively over his or her life. As a parent, Learn to celebrate effort, especially when they're in school and not just grades. That's very important. When your child is doing his or her best and putting out effort, encourage it and support him or her. As we approach Disaster Preparedness Month in the next few days, we want to bring to your attention and possibly provide solutions for a disaster that often accompanies a drought. In the case of a fire at your home, should you A, stop to get your pet, B, evacuate immediately and call the fire brigade from a neighbor's phone, or C, stop to call the fire brigade? The answer is B, evacuate immediately and call the fire brigade from a neighbor's phone. Many students know the answer to the question simply because a fire prevention officer went to their school and gave them the drill. When your clothes is on fire, you do not run. So you stop where you are, 
you fall to the ground and you roll. Public education is a key component in fire prevention. It is a proactive method of reducing emergencies and the damage caused by them by ensuring that the public is fully aware of what to do in case of an emergency. We recognize that fires start most of the time because people don't know about fires. People don't know what it takes to make a fire. People don't know what it takes to get rid of a fire. Without educating a person about the dangers of fire, then they would be um, totally lost and we will continue to have devastating fires destroying life and property. Look around for me. Make sure that everybody in the class is here. I think you should give yourselves a clap. Right. That's how we want you to operate when there is a fire, all right? Fire prevention officers go into communities, businesses, schools, churches, wherever they are granted access and educate the public on fire safety practices. And through programs like safety monitor and training, persons are taught to educate others about appropriate fire safety behavior. We go into communities, we train what we call community safety wardens or fire wardens. So they would, they would now look at the mispractices. We go into businesses, organize the staff, and we train persons to train the people in the workplace. They are also trained to a point where they can check for hazards to ensure that all the fire hazards that are, that are visible can be reduced. If it is that you require of us or you ask of us to come into your home and show you what inside there can actually start a fire and how you can prevent that fire, we actually do that and we promote as well what we call a good neighbor policy. So you ensure that your neighbor is not doing anything that will put your life in jeopardy from, from a fire and you do the same as well for your neighbors. What happens? Fire prevention does not stop at public education. There is also engineering and enforcement. You could call it the triple E effect. Engineering and enforcement go hand in hand. It's at this stage that the Fire Prevention Division review building plans, inspect buildings and assess for compliance. We encourage you to come into us, submit your building plan. We are able to look at it to see how you are going to occupy the building and then we will be able to recommend the type of devices that you would use to better protect your, your, your property and the lives that will occupy that building. Fire prevention officers should be contacted to conduct fire safety inspection as soon as new buildings are erected or existing buildings are being renovated. There is no cost attached. So you, you, you would write us a letter and you can send it in to us by email. Uh, when we get that letter, we set a date with you. We come into your building and we look at everywhere, all of the occupied space, whether doors are locked off, um, technical room, we start from the roof all the way down to basement level if there is a basement and we note everything uh, in terms of what you have in the building, what you need to do and then we would go back, make recommendations. So once you implement those recommendations, then you know that you are on the right track to have a safe building, a fire safe building to occupy. Once the inspection is complete and your building meets the required standard, you will receive a building occupancy certificate, also known as a fire certificate. The Fire Prevention Division also sees to the retrofitting of fire hydrants. In 2007, we, we did a survey. That survey was a bit dismal, to be honest. It showed that we had just about 30% of all fire hydrants across the island working. We hired two teams. Of, of hydrant maintenance persons and we placed one in the western section of the island and one in Kingston. In 2012, five years after, we did another survey and that survey is showing us that we now have over 70 percent of the fire hydrants working. So that is really saying to us that the team that we have employed is actually going out there and doing the job that is required of them. The fire brigade is on the job to ensure that you are safe in the event of a fire, but they can't go it alone. Your help is needed. Don't cook and leave it unattended. Don't overload circuits. Don't 
introduce a whole lot of electrical equipment on, on, on systems that are not designed for that heavy load. Don't allow children that are not of the age of 12 and untaught to be fooling around with, 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 with fire in general. And, and pretty much ensure that you have a plan in your home, in the building that you occupy. Ensure that the right equipment is there. Our message to the public is prevent, prevent, prevent. Once a fire starts, you need to call us. It is better for us to get on the scene and realize that you have already dealt with it than for us to get on the scene late. Because nobody likes a situation like that when we get there late and there's nothing much that, that we can actually do. For more information on the Jamaica Fire Brigade, visit their website, www.jfb.gov.jm or call 922-2523 or 922-0007. Are you in the import-export business? Do you want to get in on the island's burgeoning maritime sector? Hear this. Here in Jamaica, we have identified the positioning of the country as a major logistics hub in the Western Hemisphere as one pillar of our economic development. This ambitious initiative recently took another step forward with the launch of the Jamaica Trade Information Portal. The Jamaica Trade Information Portal is a single authoritative source for trade information directly related to import and export regulations, processes, and requirements. Businesses can conveniently access this portal at any time to retrieve relevant information they need. It is the first of its kind in the English-speaking Caribbean. This portal is part of our ongoing efforts to modernize our trade infrastructure, to improve the ease of doing business in Jamaica. In the fast-paced global market, to remain competitive, it is critical that businesses are able to access information quickly and respond effectively. The trade facilitation value of the Jamaica Trade Information Portal, when considered in the broader framework of the national foreign trade policy, is poised to have a powerful impact on global value chain participation as we strengthen our integration into the digital global economy. And that's how we close out Jamaica Magazine, but only for today. We return tomorrow around about the same time right here on this station. We maintain a constant online presence, so be sure to send your feedback to Jamaica Magazine at jis.gov.jm. Drop us a line on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel or download our mobile app. On behalf of the entire news and production team here at the GIS, I'm Sandra Clark. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.